This is the Anarchist War Journal entry number five, and I'm going to continue where I left off, interviewing a, a series of people at the International Students for Liberty Conference. The next person I have up is the amazing karaoke singer Bob Murphy, who has a voice of an angel. Uh, if you ever have a chance to listen to him sing, right? And at the same time, he happens to be a pretty good Austrian economist uh, who also teaches at the Mises Institute in Auburn, Alabama. Uh, by the end of this week, I hope to finish my application that's sent off to hopefully be a student there by the end of the semester. And yeah, let's just jump right to it, shall we? How would you find a free market yourself? I would say a free market is when people, the, the, the generally understood property rights of everyone are respected and so everyone just obeys the norms of saying if, if somebody if that's somebody's property we are not allowed to violate that no matter what we have to engage in voluntary uh, interactions I think a lot of people would hear that and say well I believe that and I would say no I don't think you do you think for example that you know the government can levy taxes or a lot of people even think if it's really an emergency that the government can conscript strip people uh, a lot of people have no problem with a, a court subpoenaing somebody to force them to testify or to force people to do a jury service. And so I would say actually a lot of people don't actually believe that people really get to retain control of their own property. They think there's all sorts of circumstances that trump it. So for me, a free market would mean what everyone recognizes as property rights are really respected. I guess that would also include, I guess, errors of minimum wage. You've done a really a lot of good research to show, I guess, in terms of that, that does not necessarily, of course, respect private property. Uh, oh, yeah, I mean, that's another great example, sure. That there, I mean, clearly everyone would admit the, the employer at the restaurant control, owns the money, then that the worker owns his or her labor, and yet they're not allowed to work at $3 an hour. That's illegal. Right. I mean, that, that's crazy. That's clearly an intervention that's not like allowing them to do what they want with their own property. Right. I've never heard of like this, the, the statistical information, even from government or other people, first time from you saying, actually, like, listen, 5% are actually on minimum wage. It's not this like really dire issue that people kind of make it out to be. Yeah, and the other thing that's interesting, too, is even if you look at the people, so I just did a study for the Fraser Institute, so I had the numbers for Canada. I, I think it's, they're similar for the U.S., but what I'm going to say now is for Canada. It's something like, uh, if you look at all minimum wage earners, um, something like 80 it's in the mid 80s percentile percentage of them earn more than the poverty level in, the, in terms of their households and vice versa if you look at the people uh, you know who are in in poverty most of them earn more than the minimum wage and so it's 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 showing you that that's sort of surprising the people who make the minimum wage typically don't come from poor households and the people who come from poor households typically make more than the minimum wage right. and that seems first you're like that's impossible no because a lot of people making the minimum wage are young people like teenagers who live, you know, they might be from the suburbs or kids going to college or whatever, you know, they don't have a real job yet. And so, but they're living with wealthy families. And so that just shows, again, it's a very blunt instrument to raise the minimum wage thinking you're helping the working poor. No, you're not. Just look at the numbers. Right. For me, it's been very helpful when there's like minimum wage rallies in my city to use this information to show them otherwise. Like what's preventing you from having a living wage? It's not McDonald's, right? It's Government, right, mm -hmm. and all the number of different ways that they kind of rob you of, I guess, of your income, of your um, your capital that you produce. Uh, the second question would be: Would you consider, I guess, do we have a free market today? No, absolutely not. Um, and that's not just a cop. I know some people like say, "Oh, well, that's what the you know the communists did, like the Soviet Union collapsed, and people would say oh, that wasn't true." But I mean, under any reasonable definition, clearly, the United States right now is nowhere near a free market economy. And the major countries, governments around the world, intervene quite heavily. They have you know huge welfare states. Right. And uh, how would you define uh, anarchy? Uh, I think anarchy would just mean the absence of a formal uh, state system. So if you think about it, like what's monarchy, it's the rule by one, you know, what's oligarchy, the rule of many, and so on. So for me, the anarchy means the rule by no one, but that doesn't mean pure chaos. Right. It just means authority is voluntarily earned. Right. So I could, you know, agree if I want to get heart surgery, there's plenty of authoritative sources I go and consult with, people who've been trained and have a reputation in the community for being good heart surgeons, but nobody is allowed to cut my chest open against my will. I guess like force authority, I guess, in that way, right? right, right. Uh, political rulers. Uh, I guess in, in that caveat in there, um, do you advocate for political rulers? Do you vote, I guess, essentially? No, I mean, I know some people think you're committing aggression by the act of voting. I don't go that far, but... So, no, I don't vote. To me, I decided a long time ago that it's just not worth it because 
it's it does you know as an economist on the margin your vote doesn't do anything right, right? it's never going to be the case that your vote was decisive for one person being elected or not and so then the question is why would you do something that philosophically is quite dubious you don't agree with the system if it doesn't even have any good consequences and so you know it might make sense to do something you feel squeamish about if it at least did something prevented a greater evil he's oh, i voted for the lesser of two evils why you didn't influence the outcome that lesser of two evils in your mind would have won either way without you or would have lost without your vote so anyway that's uh so i don't vote it's very liberating psychologically when people you know i just said no i'm not participating in this and i'm sure people are familiar with the you know the famous george carlin routine it's too salty for me to quote but you know, <laughs> saying it's actually you know, people say if you don't vote you can't complain he says no it's the opposite if yeah. you did vote, you participated in the system, and you got you know the outcome. Whereas I just stood on the side and said, I don't have anything to do with this thing. So I'm the one who gets to complain. Yeah, I, I'm not going to participate in my own enslavement. Yeah, thank you very much. Right. Um, all right, great. I guess uh, the last question, like, what, what do you see, I guess, in, in the future of this? Do you feel that perhaps, like, near, I guess, where, like, there's Trump and Sanders, do you feel like perhaps inevitably it's going to collapse, right? 97% of the value has, has been lost. People have always been talking about, well, I guess, like, you have people, like, uh, been talking about, like, well, I guess the inevitable collapse is going to occur. They've been talking about for a couple of decades, like, they're trying to prolong as long as they will or, or can. Um, what do you, where do you see the future, I guess, in terms yeah, of that? I economy? am very concerned about the economy, not just the United States, but all the Western powers uh, over the next, let's say, five to ten years, I think. I don't know what the exact timing is going to be because they can keep pushing back the inevitable. Right. It looks like since Janet Yellen came in that her job has been to be the fall guy or gal, because they, they, you know, the so-called taper, that started the first month after, or it was like the last month of Bernanke's chairmanship was when that started. So she has presided over winding down all that stuff, So I th and they started raising interest rates. So if I had to guess, I would say they're going to hold pat and let the thing come down. Um, so, but, so economics teaches us, that, or Austrian economics at least, that if they blow up a bubble, an unsustainable boom, eventually there has to be a reckoning. Right. You can't get around that, and so they can you know, push it back if they want to by inflating more, but that would just make the reckoning that much worse. Right. So my guess is, so this isn't Austrian economics, this is my guess reading the tea leaves. I think they decided we're going to just let it come down, and they're getting ready. I mean, there's all sorts of things, the Dodd-Frank Act and other things seeing uh, fat cut and so on that the authorities are putting in place. I think getting ready, and also all the stuff about, I mean, that's real about the Department of Homeland Security buying all those billions of rounds of ammunition and stuff. So I think they are getting ready for massive civil unrest because they know the economy is going to crash and we got to be ready to maintain law and order when people start flipping cars. Right. My last question would be, has uh, Krugman accepted your debate uh, yet? <laughs> <laughs> no, if, uh, if you people go to YouTube, I have a, a video up there. I titled it, Move Paul's Book. And you, if you watch it, you'll see why I chose that title. No, somebody kind of ambushed him when he was doing a talk show promoting his own book, saying, hey, Krugman, are you going to debate this uh, Robert Murphy guy? And Krugman said, come on, this is a serious matter. This isn't going to be settled with sound bites or what." So he was. So he, he, <laughs> he officially said in public, he's never debating me because I'm a clown and you know he's a serious But what person. about the children, right? You have right. like a donation yeah, yeah, yeah. thing kind of right. getting ready to kind of be released yeah, once we this had, debate. It was over $100,000. We've over gone to a food bank in New York City, so... What about the children? Not for him, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I love your video when you had uh, your punching gloves on. and <laughs> Stoke, <laughs> kinda... Stoke the fear, yes. That's a good one. <laughs> well, thank you so much sure, for coming thanks, out. Yeah. I really appreciate uh, the work that you do. I think it's uh, very important, I guess, yeah. for, to kind of... Okay, I will say, like, tyranny wins by default. Nobody kind of steps up to the plate and, and champion and hit, hit that stuff uh, away. Yeah, I should just say that, you know, when I, because I don't... Even though I don't vote, it's not because, oh, I just give up. To me, I think educating people and getting them to see... You know, get more and more people to realize that liberty is the right solution and that the state is not going to help you, that's more important than going and, in my mind, wasting your time doing something that really has no effect whatsoever in terms of voting for someone that you feel bad about anyway. All right. Thank you so much for your courage. Sure Thank thanks. you for Thank everything you. you're doing out here. Thanks a lot. And that was the uh, the interview. You're probably wondering where are the uh, cuts for narrative criticism, so I really don't have any. Um, this guy is, has always kind of been legit. Uh, the only questions I've always had was uh, his position on voting because I could never really, never heard him voice any kind of opinion or thoughts on that. Uh, so that was the only thing that's always uh, just, eh, just had me uh, curious, right? So uh, it was great to finally meet him in person and to ask, <laughs> uh, do you advocate for political rulers? And he doesn't, right? Great, great response. Uh, of course, as a way an economist would respond, right? Uh, opportunity costs. And so, of course, yeah, when it goes back to uh, voting for the lesser of evils, you kind of have to remember 
Are you really going to trust the word of a murderous sociopath that he or she will hurt you not as much? Right? Uh, but yeah, um, this guy is uh, pretty awesome. Check out his videos. He's got great educational sources on, um, on pretty much everything, uh, especially minimum wage. Uh, found a lot of great stuff there uh, for me to take in as well when I go out there, to, when I went out there and will continue to do so, of course, whenever these minimum wage tyranny mob rallies occur, um, you kind of have to confront them, right? Because if uh, no one else is out there providing a voice of reason, then people are just going to say, well, I guess this is, this kind of makes sense, right? Uh, so yeah, he's a pretty awesome guy. Um, and I look forward uh, to seeing him continue to swing away at all these uh, economic myths and, and tyranny, especially, right? So it's not just that he's not doing anything, right? Education is a great big uh, work towards uh, achieving freedom in our lifetime. Uh, there's a lot of uh, disinformation that many of us have been misled into believing, right, at these especially public indoctrination camps. So, yeah, I applaud him for that. I would say, yeah, Bob Murphy is another great champion of liberty out there. And I look forward to him continuing uh, a lot of the awesome work that he does out there as well. And, yeah, I guess we'll see if I run into him again at the Mises Institute. So with that... That kind of wraps up this uh, entry. I'm going to uh, work on the next one. The next one coming up will be Jan Hellfield. And that one should be quite interesting. So until then, I'll see you guys at the victory party. Take good care.